Mr. Ben Justice was born in 1973, not but about 80 miles from where I was born. Camden, Arkansas is where I was based. He in Hot Springs, Arkansas, there's where he was born. And then he moved across the Mississippi River to over there, not Mississippi, but Mississippi. Uh, and uh, you know who's a true Mississippian if they say Mississippi. Uh, he attended the uh, Tennessee School of Preaching. He's been preaching for 10 years, including uh, state of Mississippi, Kentucky, Alabama, and Tennessee, and is preaching in Sullivan, Missouri. He's married to Pam. They have one son, Wade, and one daughter. Uh, though I've never been around him very close, and we know of his faith and his determination to do what is right, and that means a, a lot to us. And so we want to hear his ecumenical movement, the way to biblical unity. Brother Ben, please come speak to us. Even though this is the uh, first year to be on this, what I consider to be one of the greatest lectureships of brotherhood, I have uh, followed it for many, many years, uh, I guess ever since its inception, and, and I have all of the books that are in print, and uh, um, what great uh, lectureships uh, are conducted here each and every year, and all of this uh, material has accumulated throughout the years, we do desperately uh, get this out to uh, the Brotherhood and even the world at large. But I'm thankful and uh, honored at the um, opportunity to be here. I appreciate so much the, the invitation to be with you here on this uh, lectureship. The month was August, and it was 1948. This was the and climactic year for the modern ecumenical movement when some 147 different churches, just bodies that's in Amsterdam to constitute what's now known as the World Council of Churches, also known as the WCC for short. Their goal, their mission, their aim is uh, very simple, very easy to understand. It is a movement whose goal is, quote, Christian unity and fellowship. I believe, as we shall see subsequently in this lesson here today, that there is absolutely nothing Christian about the ecumenical movement. And then we progress a couple of years to November 1950, which was the climactic year for the formation of the National Council of Churches, or NCC for short. While the World Council of Churches embodies religious organizations on a worldwide scale, the National Council of Churches is more peculiar to the USA with its location and its headquarters in New York. But be that any, their goal, the mission, the aim is the same, quote, Christian unity and fellowship. Bring everything for a common bond in working and worshiping, evangelizing the world all together. This morning we want to spend our time looking at this question, is the ecumenical movement the way to biblical fellowship? And there is so much material it has been written on the modern ecumenical movement. One can get quite bogged down in the amount of information in print. And so here today we're only going to briefly analyze a few points to help us understand some things about this movement and its 
relation to unity and to fellowship. Three points that we want to develop, and there's so much material there in the book, but the three points that we want to consider is, number one, we want to explain or get an explanation of what this movement is all about. And again, we can only be brief as we look at the point. And then secondly, we want to notice some errors concerning the ecumenical movement. And then we want to consider the effects of this movement that it has wreaked upon not only the religious world at large, but the body of Christ as well. So let's begin with the first one. How we explain the, this movement, the ecumenical movement. Well, it's ecumenical is from a word literally meaning the inhabited world. It is a movement in which it is proposed that the world and those who profess to be Christians or have any semblance of it whatsoever come to get in one habitated place and work together and be united and be one. One source offers the following. Quote, in its meaning, ecumenism refers to initiatives aimed, aimed at worldwide religious unity. In a narrower sense, it refers to the movement towards unity among Christians. In this sense, ecumenism is based on the idea that there should be a single Christian church, single Christian faith. Perhaps there is an element of truth in that, in that there is or should be a single, as they say, Christian church, a single Christian faith. We would not necessarily agree with that terminology. No Christian has or owns a church. It is the Lord's church. It is Christ's church. It is Christ's faith, the faith, the gospel system of faith. One writer stated this concerning this movement that it is a movement, that is, it is a name given to the movement aimed at the unification of the Protestant churches of the world and ultimately of all Christians. Now, I believe we need to say at the outset, we would all agree with this, that there is absolutely nothing wrong with having as our goal unity. We all want unity. We want oneness. John 17, 20 and 21 Ephesians 4, verses 3 and following, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, and so many other passages that we could look at, teaches us that we should strive to have unity. But the fundamental error and the fundamental flaw of the ecumenical movement is unity at the expense and eyes of truth. The website for the WCC, and you can go to the site and learn a whole lot about this uh, movement, about this organization, but it reveals the following on their website. <clears throat> it says, quote, for its member churches, the WCC is a unique space, one in which they can reflect, speak, act, worship, and work together. Notice that, friends, worship together. Challenge and support each other, share and debate as members of this fellowship. Notice that, friends, they refer to it as this fellowship. WCC member churches are called to the goal of visible unity in one faith and one Eucharistic fellowship, promote their common witness and work for mission and evangelism. Engage in Christian service by serving human needs, breaking down barriers between people, seeking justice and peace, and upholding the integrity of creation and foster renewal and unity of mission and service. Some of you may have heard of a week of prayer. Every year there is a week that is devoted to prayer. And it is a week of prayer that is directly tied in with the modern ecumenical movement. Its goal is for local organizations, religious bodies, to express in prayer the call for Christian unity. 
And proponents often refer to the week of prayer as the very soul of the ecumenical movement. And they believe that they are just continuing what the Lord began in John 17, 20, and 21. Where he prayed to his Father, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. It's interesting in my research of a movement. that they focus quite heavily upon young people. In fact, many uh, organizations that are geared toward the young people, the Young Men's Christian Association, Young Women's Christian Association, all of these organizations are like organizations paved the way for the eventual formation of the Council of Churches. And so they focus upon young people. We understand why, because young people are impressionable, aren't they not? You know, if you can get a, a young person to believe and adopt this philosophy, their philosophy and fellowship, then you've gone a long way in accomplishing their goal in bringing about this, this movement of unity and fellowship. Well, liberals in the church do that, don't they? They try their very, very best to get to people. And you people, they go to these uh, youth rallies and what have you, and you don't know, have any problem with young people getting together. They need to get together. They need to enjoy one another's company as brothers and sisters in Christ if they've obeyed the gospel. And to be around those who have things in common, But you know, I've known some youth leaders and youth directors to tell young people at some of these rallies, now you don't have to worry about going back and, and you know, telling your elders what's going on here. And so focusing upon people is one of the goals of the ecumenical movement. Secondly, let's turn our attention to some of the errors that are associated with this movement. Of course, the main issue at hand here is the fact that uh, this movement seeks unity at the expense and the demise of truth. There is really no standard whatsoever when it comes to this movement. But as the case is, with any false religious, there are so many, many, many errors, and false doctrines involved. For example, the website for the WCC declares, quote, that membership in the Church of Christ, notice how they use that terminology there, the Church of Christ, goes beyond one's own church, and that others possess at the very least elements of the true church. And that, friends, others possess other churches, at the very least, they contain elements of the true church. This statement is very revealing, is it not? And it shows that they haven't a clue about the church that Jesus established and founded and built. It implies that Christ has more than one church and that all of these churches are acceptable to the Lord. This statement reveals that they know nothing about the law of identity. There's that all identifying marks must be present. In other words, how could other churches contain at least elements of the true church and still be the Lord's true church if it does not contain all elements of the church. You know, it's like saying, uh, you know, a man contain elements of another man, but no elements and still be that other man. <laughs> Concerning its funding, their website says this, the work of the WCC is financed by contributions from its member churches 
and funds received from church-related organizations, foundations, and individuals. The council also receives income from investment, rentals of offices in the Ecumenical Center in Geneva, fees for courses at the Ecumenical Institute and sale of WCC publications. And you contrast this, friends, with the fact that the New Testament only authorizes what kind of offerings? Free will offerings. For raising funds to carry out the work of the church, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find authority for raising funds through investments, rentals, fees, or publications to carry out the work of the church. Well, this is what they do, and so, so many others as well in the world. But again, friends, the main issue at hand dealing with here today is her concerning unity and fellowship. Unity and fellowship. The instant proposal for Christian unity, which is a brief work dealing with the ecumenical movement, but in this particular proposal for Christian unity, it states the following about this towards unity and fellowship. It says, quote, Visible Christian unity is thus not a modern unity, but a permanent and central aspect of Christian life that's already in virtue of our common faith, which unites us in a single, a single Savior. And listen to it, friends. And it, that is this call to unity, it continues to call us beyond differences of theology and worship that have developed over centuries to a deeper unity of common prayer, common witness, shared conviction, and mutual acceptance. Did you get that? This call for unity, this together to be unified, to be one, to be in fellowship, is a call beyond differences. What did the quote say? In theology and worship. So it doesn't make any difference what you believe in theological matters. It doesn't matter how you worship God, we can all come there and be united in Jesus. If you will, take your New Testaments and turn to John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. You know, friends, almost every single work that I consulted dealing with the modern ecumenical movement consistently referred to our Lord's prayer for unity for once here in John 17 verse 23. And they believe that they're just continuing that here in this day and in this movement. Jesus said, Neither say I for these alone. That is, speaking about his disciples, his apostles. But for them also which shall be on me through their word. That is, the apostles' word. And then in verse 21, Jesus said or prayed, That they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one another, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The word that, which begins verse 21, expresses aim and purpose in order that. But the foundation of that is seen in verse 20. Jesus prayed for all of those who would believe him. It would be through the apostles' word, the testimony of the apostles. We now have been written for the New Testament. When people do that, then what can there be? That in order that they may be one. And then Jesus further defines that oneness, doesn't he? He says, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Believing on Jesus, and the word believe here is a synecdoche, which stands for all that is involved in the salvation process, meaning obedience. Those who would believe on Jesus 
Not just believe anything you want to believe about the Lord, but through the testimony of the apostles. And so what do you have, friends? You have the word of the apostles, which produces the belief in Jesus, the obedience to his will, which in turn produces the unity and oneness. That they all may find. Now, if you will, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 and 44. Here I believe that we have a parallel to what our Lord said and prayed for in John 17, verses 22 through 23. It's 2 and uh, verse 42. The early Christians, as Luke records, continued steadfastly in, what does the Bible say? The apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly in the teachings of the apostles. And then we see the result of this in verse 44. There's a direction here in verse 44. And all that believed were together. And not all things come. What do you see there in verse 44? You see unity and oneness. Based upon the fact that they all continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, isn't this exact parallel to what Jesus prayed in John 17? Believe on me through the testimony of the apostles. Why? That you all may be one. And so the foundation for unity and for oneness is the Word of God. The apostles' teachings. This New Testament is the will. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10 Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. There be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same job. When Paul said you speak the same thing, he obviously did not mean you can speak anything you want to speak and be united upon that. Speaking the same thing has a standard, does it not? And it is the Word of God. First John 1 and verse 3, John said, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. Why, John? Yes. That, or in order that you also may have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, verses 3 to 6, Paul writing to the church, church at Ephesus, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice that, friends, we are to endeavor to keep unity, to have unity in oneness. But then in the subsequent verses, verses 4 to 6, Paul sets forth the platform, the basis, the foundation for unity. It says there is one. And one it, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one fall. There is one body. Now, what does the medical movement say? What does the religious world say? Well, there are many bodies. All are acceptable uh, to the Lord. The Bible says there's one body, which is the one church that Jesus established. One baptism. How many baptisms do, does the religious world accept and practice today? Well, many. One faith. Has anyone ever asked you what faith you are? What faith do you belong to? As if to imply there are many that are acceptable to the Lord, but while there may be many faiths, there's only one that is acceptable, and that is the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 John, verses 9 through 11, John said, Whosoever transgress and abideth not the of Christ hath not God. He that hideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine. Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. And then the reason is given. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker, that is, in fellowship with his evil deeds. You know, if these were the only verses that we had, Second John, verses 9 to 11, dealing with this subject, they utterly repudiate and annihilate the modern ecumenical movement and all unity movements today. 
doctrine of Christ is the foundation for unity and fellowship. And so it's this condition that must exist but the right hands of fellowship can be extended. And this principle is seen in Galatians 2 verse 9. Remember when the leaders in the Jerusalem uh, church there extended to Paul and Barnabas what does the Bible say? The right hands of fellowship. But they did not do that until they established the facts of the matter and recognized them as true, genuine workers of the Lord, all as a true and genuine apostle of Jesus Christ, and the fact that God had commissioned them to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And they extended to them the right hand of fellowship. The Bible teaches that a person must be, must be, and this was brought out in our previous lecture, and we throughout this lectureship. The Bible teaches that a person must be in fellowship with God before we can be in fellowship with that person. But we teach that Christians must not fellowship those in doctrinal or moral error. I want to read to you a portion of an article that I came across. Some of you may recognize this. This article did with the ecumenical movement and this article refutes in very, very fine fashion what is wrong with this movement. He says this. I'll give the name of the author here in just a few moments. But he says this. The fact of the matter that the ecumenical movement has been spawned by liberalism and there's only one more weapon in its arsenal to destroy true Christian. Ecumenism is seeking harmony and peace at the ends of revealed truth. It is an attempt to reconcile differences by means of a deliberate deviation from the will of God. It is condemned in Scripture to be by the people of God. He goes on to say, The fact remains that there can be no fellowship among parties whose disagreements involve issues of truth and error. In matters of faith, we must be altogether in top of anything that falls short of being the truth. For example, he says, there can be no spiritual fellowship, Christian and one who denies that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There can be no fellowship between a Christian and one who denies that baptism is essential unto the remission of sins. There can be no fellowship between a Christian and any erring brother who is living an immoral life. Why, he says, because the child of God is arrogant and self-righteous? No! He says, but because his fellowship can only be with such men, why? He cannot bestow fellowship on men. The Lord has denied it in his word. But he goes on to say that the ecumenical movement would do just this very thing. It would create a situation where men would supposedly be in fellowship while holding contrary views on the virgin birth, inheritance of scripture, necessity of baptism, and the salvation, etc., etc. It goes on to expose the ecumenical movement in very way man who wrote that article, I just quoted from, is the very man who served and continues to serve, as a matter of fact, as one of the pioneer perpetrators in the advancement of the modern ecumenical movement of the Lord's Church today. And that man's name is Rubel Shelley. It is hard to conceive how a man can stand directly up and opposed. He wrote, I believe, in 1973 in the spiritual sword. What about the effects of this movement? And certainly we understand that this movement has infected and affected the religious world at large, but it has certainly affected the body of Christ as well. Is not this ecumenical mindset prevalent in so many members of the Lord's Church today? They, you know, we have these uh, unit movements, these unity forums, wherein compromise is the name of the game, seeking to have unity and oneness with nations. Pulpit swaps with denominational theologians are quite common. Ecumenical worship is seen quite frequently. And I'm afraid that too many members of the church, the, well, it's no big deal, so what? Leave me alone attitude. People have replaced God's objective, authoritative word, their own subjective feelings and inclinations. 
Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And thrown out the window, hasn't it? Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. It is by the authority of the Lord. And that is completely and totally ignored by so many today. The late Thomas B. Warren wrote words in 1988. He says, To all who are familiar with what is being said from many pulpits and written in many journals by our brethren today, it is clear that these words apply quite sadly to many gospel preachers today. In the early 1970s, ecumenism was a miracle as it made its way into the church, but now, he says, it's different. Now the floodgates of apostasy are pouring as a flood into the Lord's church. You know, he was exactly right, but here is 20 years later. And not only do we have a flood, but we have a tsunami on our hands. Is the ecumenical movement the way to biblical unity and fellowship? No, my friends, it is not. It is based upon diversity and matter of truth and doctrine. It overlooks truth, and it destroys what Christianity is all about. And even though many in the Lord's church today are blurring the lines of Christian fellowship, Gentlemen, the Bible teaches the same on fellowship when many brethren were once considered faithful, but they now have gone out from us. I want to read one other thing to you. This writer says that the in writing about the ecumenical movement, he says the so-called ecumenical movement has entered the thinking of some in the churches of Christ, especially some among Christian university professors and in the elitist Christian scholars cause elite by their own assessment. He goes on to say this, those who transgress the doctrine of Christ have not God. We can have no fellowship, and he put that in bold, no fellowship with unbelievers and mistakes. False teachers are heretics. They must not, again in bold, they must not be fellowship if they refuse to repudiate their false doctrine and return to the truth. And so he says that this ecumenical movement this mindset has entered the thinking of some, which is absolutely true, but the said that his brother Curtis Cates prayed that the ecumenical set has entered the thinking of brother Curtis Cates. Such is a sad state of affairs that we find ourselves in. Some brethren need to get their head out of the sand Stop pretending like the evidence is not there for the compromise that is taking place within the body of Christ. And I know this lectureship is going to deal with these things, and I appreciate so much this very timely theme on fellowship from God or man. We have our work cut out for us, great sacrifice. Sacrifice, love, and standing for the truth. But if we're going to make it to heaven, friends, we must stand for the truth. And so God must rise up and expose this dillish spirit of ecumenism in and out of the body of Christ, as was pointed out in our last lecture. We need to do it with love and kindness, but we boldly. Souls are at stake, brethren. Souls are at stake. We're not playing Boy Scouts. This is serious business. It's going to determine where you and I are in eternity, even heaven, devil's hell. We need to remember that. I'm afraid that so many have gotten away from the fact that souls are at stake, and they're being led away into digression and apostasy and error. Thank you so much for your very kind attention this morning. Well, the Justice has done such a tremendous job in setting out material that, for the most of us in this auditorium, I think we are very much aware of the principles that are involved. Good to hear, though, uh, the specifics about the economic movement and shows you that what goes and comes around.
whether it's in the church or otherwise. Brother Daniel, if you're going to speak, let's come up where we can hear you. Well, but it won't make a difference. You can't be heard unless you come up here. He's not an Adrian Roger Coleman. Now, nobody knows what in the world that means, two or three of them. <laughs> <laughs> Adrian Rogers, uh, he's dead now, been dead for a year or so, maybe a couple of years, was a, a pretty popular Baptist preacher in the Memphis area. Memphis, wasn't it? Memphis area, and well known among his people. Uh, uh, he turned out to be one of Barry Grider's favorite preachers. So that's what he's referring to on that line, Barry Grider being the preacher at Forest Hill. Uh, and I don't think I misrepresent Barry when I say that because I think he said to other people. Um, and I'm not trying to say Barry believes everything that this man taught that was error. That's not the point. Uh, Keith, it's said in the context of this particular sermon relative to the ecumenical mentality. I think the greatest thing is being brought out, if nothing else, in this whole lectureship, and I've heard it said over and over again, although it's an exceedingly sad thing, especially of us who have been around for a little while and know so much of the work done. According to Brother Warren, the importance of thinking straight and gathering all the evidence in proper context on a given subject before you start your thing, knowing how to ascertain Bible authority, to see so many men that I thought, I'm just telling you my personal feelings, my personal thoughts on the matter, had that pretty well straight. And then to realize that when push came to shove or some favorite something or somebody, they very quickly uh, retreated into this mindset that's been presented this morning, and they've done it by rejecting all manner of evidence. They are not open to evidence. It just comes down to that on certain things. Now, I'm not saying overall, but on certain things. And they need to remember what has been taught by Paul. Evil seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So that's a, a very important point to keep in mind. When Brother Lester Kemp wrote what he did a year ago, and then uh, one of the graduates of uh, Memphis called signed himself over it, where the faith was being put out at that time and stopped. And if you read Continuing for the Faith, you notice that we got the letter that Brother Coates wrote. Did I say Coates? Pardon me, Brother Coates, wherever you are. You don't fit this, I hope. <laughs> Brother Cates, Brother Curtis Cates, director of Memphis School of Preaching, wrote, supposedly in defense of himself, which is one of the saddest documents I've read from an experienced preacher and educated man in a long time. But it shows you the complete effort to dodge out on evidence and make it out to be something he knows very well it's not. And deal with matters that are just absolutely uh, not what we're talking about. He took the matter of the money things that were talked about and made it as if we were talking about his own personal handling of his own money and his own... Uh, whatever money he's got in salary. Had nothing to do with that. We go on record again. It had nothing to do with that. But he could not see It was well set out earlier by Brother York when it came to Balaam. Because that article was about. He couldn't see it. He could not see that he what he had confessed before made it very clear, which was one of the reasons uh, Brother our brethren, McLeish and Watson, were given their wallpapers from the Gospel Journal, is that if you don't get rid of Dub McLeish, we're cutting our off to MSOP. That's all that was said. He admitted that. And yet he denied it and said, no, you're talking about, look what we sacrificed for whatever. Well, that has nothing to do with anything. But have you noticed the screens and the straw men and the you're another one argument? Well, if I am another one, what have we accomplished? Are you happy to go to hell because I'm going? I mean, what kind of sense is that? It just doesn't make any. We must not fall into that. Brethren, if it caught those men and has caught them so far because of a particular dedication and whatever you want to have to a subject or a person, 
the tie that binds them. So much so that when truth came up against their error, they embraced the error rather than the evidence that pointed to the truth of the thing. It can happen to you and me. He that thinketh he standeth, he lest he fall. Uh, we must consider ourselves, lest we also be tempted. So whatever, any sin any man can commit, you can and I can. Well, what keeps us from it? A determination not to, and that we just will not allow ourselves to be so connected and, and bound up in something that it just makes it almost impossible for us to say, no, I'm going with the truth no matter the sacrifice, no matter what it is. And that's what's happened. People can say what they want to say. That's exactly what's happened. Because I say again, they preach the same thing we preach this morning or any other time. It just simply comes down to they have a selective uh, group that they're not going to apply the truth to. That's not going to do it. They say what they want to about it. Uh, they are anyway. But you'll notice they're saying it at a great distance uh, over the phone and in letters. They're not coming out openly and doing it. That says as well their situation is anything I can think of. He shouldn't have given me about much back, but we appreciate it. Uh, Brother Justice, thank you for coming our way. Appreciated that so very much. We'll adjourn to the top of the hour. Thank